so I'm refreshing the buckets in here. I don't really empty out the old buckets unless there's a lot of roots in them. But I'm refreshing them with perlite. The roots that are in there from last year, and I just, you know, go ahead and uh, mash them up and, and squeeze them. There's really nothing in there. But I just keep them and refresh the perlite and put new perlite over it. take a bucket and then I'll just fill up to about here on all my buckets and like I said I don't really like take them all out and wash them and I used to do that to throw them out but the perlite just does fine unless you see like big clumps of root like when you do squash uh, tomatoes just pretty much dissolve through the winter because I just let them overwinter and get dirty you can see some get dirty and so uh, that's what I do when I fill them. And then I'll probably just pressure wash the tops so that they look clean. And uh, then I'll fix the pipes and everything and then call it a day. Also that I have uh, paint strainer fabric and sometimes it needs replaced in here to keep everything alive and, and all that there's like paint strainer fabric you can see it so I make sure that that's not too worn out because you want to be able to pull this out in case of an emergency like the roots have gone into the, um, the, the uh, drains or something and clogging it up you want to be able to lift the whole plant out without hurting I'll also use a wheelbarrow to do mixing, like if uh, there's something full of roots, then I'll go and put the whole bucket in there, so the perlite empty it out, <coughs> maybe a few buckets, and then sift it all out, all the roots in like chunks, and then uh, mix the new perlite in there, and then put the new mix in the, in the buckets. You'll also find out that the perlite will break down over time into this finer, granular stuff over the years, and uh, that's okay too. And I don't get rid of it. Some people probably will complain that, oh my gosh, you're using dirty perlite. But also, if you live in a city, this is going to be hard to get rid of. I mean, is it compost? Is it recyclable? Do you throw this in the trash? Do you throw it, you know, wherever? So learning where to handle your perlite is important too. So now that we have the soilless green system set up with the new perlite, and we've tested the pump and we got everything back on, uh, now it's time to plant the plants. I'm not going to go full board like I did last year, but I thought it would be interesting to show you how I did some of the plants. So uh, that's what we'll be doing now. So how I normally do things is I'll take the plant, and uh, my plants will generally have little roots on them from soil, because of how I started them. So I have to wash the soil off to get it into the perlite. So you don't have to be perfect, but that's what I do. And I use a bucket, and then I just use a hose, and I just take all the soil out as gently as I can. So this is a rather lanky tomato. They should have been in the ground a while ago. So this is what happens when you get a greenhouse that doesn't have the summer light, but it does have the summer heat because it's a heated greenhouse. So it gets really long and lanky, but these things swell up very nicely. So, you know, it's in a... Uh, It's in a little thing of dirt, and so we just wash that off with a shower. And then we put it into the prepared perlite that you'll see in a second. Now I like to dunk them up and down and use my fingers a little bit to massage the soil loose. So that it gets out all of the stuff pretty easy because I don't like dirt contaminating the perlite which is the medium there we go see all of that is gone so now I like to bury these like in the little U if I can because all of this stuff will turn into roots all of this 
will turn into root, which will give it more roots than just at the end. So that's how I deal with, uh, and you could do this in dirt too, you don't need to do it in the hydroponics. So here's my progress. I've, uh, it's easier when you don't have any perlite in there at the beginning and then you just fill it after you put the roots in. But since I have the perlite in there, I generally just kind of do my hand and go scoop with the, the root ball in, in my hand. You just sort of kind of scoop and kind of bury the plant inside the perlite as far down as you can get it. Because as you see from the drains, it's about an inch, inch and a half that will always have water in it. So if the system fails, it will still be able to have water at least until you figure out why. So there's my tomatoes. They look a little scraggly. They always do because their heirlooms are not the store-bought stuff that is going to be just packed with like solid green. And here are my peppers. So this will be interesting. I'm going to plant some squash and stuff that will go over this and drip down fruit, hopefully. And yeah, it'll be a little shady, but it worked pretty fun last time. So we'll see what happens. But I wanted the tomatoes to get sun. And like I said, I'm not going all out with this hydroponic system this year because I wanted to do some maintenance. So yeah, let's take a look at some guts. These are the peppers that have been inside the greenhouse that are now out. They will die in the winter because uh, I'm done with them pretty much. They're the super hots, the reapers. And you can see they have their second set of fruit just doing fine and flowering again. And you can see the guys. These are actually the grass. But our mission, uh, well, as the birds, is uh, to go to the tank. Here's the setup. It looks a little messy. Uh, inside is a temperature probe, a parts per million probe and a pH meter that are all rigged up to the system. The system is also on a timer that I'll show you all when I get out um, that will distribute and spray the water for a certain amount of period uh, every few hours. So let's get this open. Ah yes, the gut's all crammed in here. So here's the trimeter that I use and it shows all of this. This is how I turn the pump on and off. In here is also where the sump pump is on all the time. So it's directly connected in. And so the three tools will uh, work together to give me my hydroponics. Here's my system set up. It's also programmed to go off at night and it won't turn on. It'll just, you know, when it senses that there's no temperature, it'll uh, turn off the system. So there's the system when it's all better. And so we have some uh, action. We have the sump pump that worked. We have the, uh, when you turn it on, the pump's turned on for a minute. Looks like we have some unhappy numbers. So once I start putting the nutrient solution in, the numbers will start to change and the pH level will drop and the parts per million, the nutrient solution will go up and everyone will be happy. I have the roof over my tomatoes so they don't get wet, the leaves. And I think I'm going to plant, like I said, the squash over there. For fun, this is my apple tree that has, uh, I trained over a trellis. So that's been pretty fun. And now it's trained on the bottom. And there's some tea on top of my table with the birds. So I've been telling you about some interesting devices like the multimeter that I just showed you. But part of the Tamanaka Collective is also involved in new ideas like uh, making IoT devices so that I can control sensors myself. So as a, a quick experiment here, I, uh, what you're looking at here, let me get. This is an IoT device that I created and what it does is it turns on and off a light wirelessly from an app that I made. Well, it's, you know, it's a website. Uh, and the idea is that it can turn on and off anything from the internet anywhere using the code that I wrote instead of some cloud. So it's a lot cheaper. The device is low cost and all that. So um, what I want to show you next also is another device. It's a temperature and humidity sensor that will send Wi-Fi data 
it'll send the temperature and humidity periodically to the website. And so maybe I can have some action, like turn on a fan or whatever, using this device to, uh, you know, once the temperature is exceeded or, or whatever from the other device sensing it. So, you know, it's part of the fun of uh, creating cool and interesting things. So another part of this is the temperature and humidity sensor, which is this device. And it will report, there's some numbers for you. Uh, it'll report temperature and humidity wirelessly using Wi-Fi to um, my server and take regular temperature readings.